Well, hello and welcome to this episode of the Terry Cole Show. I am so excited for you to watch this episode with Africa Brooke. She is a globally recognized coach, consultant, thinker, and writer who specializes in helping people move through self-censorship and other forms of self-sabotage to get to authentic self-expression. This is a juicy episode. I hope that you enjoy it as much as I enjoyed interviewing Africa. I am so excited to welcome Africa Brooke to the Terry Cole Show. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm very excited for this conversation. I feel like I say what I'm about to say every time I sit down with someone, but it's always true. And it's that I never know where the conversation is going to go. It's not even something that I think about in much depth once I say yes to it happening. Um, and I think that's where most of the magic happens because it, it just means that we'll flow wherever it needs to go to. So thank you so very much for having me. Thank you. You are so welcome. All right. So how, how we actually got here is that both of us were speakers at the almost 30 day camp in July, I believe it was. Yes. And I already was familiar with your work prior to that. I spoke right before you and then my team um, recorded it for me and I was able to listen afterwards and they were all like, Africa was amazing. We have to get around the show. And that's exactly how this came about. So I want to get dive right into what you're really about right now and what you've been talking about, which, and it's so timely, which you know, mm -hmm. but self-censorship. So let's talk about, first of all, what, what drew you, why is self-censorship and the self-sabotage that comes along with self-censorship, mm -hmm. why is that this area of specialty for you? Yeah, so that's a that's a very, very good question. And it's something that is not sudden by any means. I think when people hear the term self-censorship, because of the time that we're in right now, it will resonate in a very different way. But we are in a time where we all know what that term even means. And I think that speaks for itself in many ways. But for me, self-censorship and self-sabotage is something I've been familiar with for quite a long time. Um, just to sort of summarize uh, my story in the best way that I can. But when I was growing up, my father was an alcoholic and you know, with that came a lot of abuse, physical abuse as well. Um, this was back in Zimbabwe where I'm from, where I was born and raised. And I'm sure this might resonate with someone listening, but when you are in a home where there's abuse or you just, there's so much uncertainty, you just never know what's around the corner you do learn to censor yourself as a form of protection. You just do. It's a way of making sure you don't say the wrong thing at the wrong time because there, there's going to be consequences for that. So I kind of became a master at censoring myself at quite, at quite a very, very young age. And it took a turn from, I would say, the age of 14 up until 24 when I myself started having a very... Um, a really destructive relationship with alcohol, uh, which is what I like to refer to it as, where I was no longer censoring myself in the way that I did in my household, but I was censoring who I truly was, who I needed to be. Um, and I felt as though I could only be those things, whether that is being desirable, uh, being loved by people, being accepted in many other ways. I thought alcohol was the only vehicle for me to get what I needed. So that self-censorship, if you will, quickly became self-sabotage, me getting in my own way, even when I didn't intend to. Um, so after I relapsed about seven times from the age of 19 to 24, the final time in 2016, I always say is different because I realized that there was an opportunity there for me to really understand why I was finding myself in that repetitive cycle which is when I actually came across the term self-sabotage. It's something that I knew intuitively, but I, I didn't have the language for it. Like many other things, right? We know it because we feel it and we've lived it, but we, we just don't know what to call it. Um, so I just became fascinated with the concept of self-sabotage, started to unravel a lot of my own history, discovered what self-censorship was and how it shows up, not just... Um, on an individual level, but also a collective level, which is, I'll tie this back to the work that I do now. So 
this has been my life's work for the past five years, but not just my own subjective experience. I started to train to really understand how the brain works, the behavioral cycles that we find ourselves in, speaking to hundreds at this point in time, thousands of people, to just understand the cycles that we find ourselves in that still connect us in some kind of way. Um, boundaries is also a huge part of that, which is why I just adore the work that you do. Um, where it stands now, Terry, with, with self-sabotage and self-censorship is that I no longer look at it so much on an individual level. In my private work, I do. But in my public work, I'm now much more interested in understanding what self-sabotage and self-censorship looks like on a mass scale, on a collective level, which is where we are right now. People are afraid to ask questions. People are afraid to have differing political uh, standings, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that's kind of um, a very big nutshell <laughs> for you. <laughs> But I love the the backstory because it really brings um, an understanding of your personal connection, why this mattered to you personally, because mm -hmm. it's you the pain that you experienced in your life. And there's there's a point where we just have to go, literally, I can't go on like this. Like something yes. has got to give. You walked us through something in the almost 30 um, teaching that you had done. And I, mm -hmm. I wonder if you would talk a little bit about um, the pillars of yes. moving right from self-censorship mm -hmm. to authentic self-expression. Yes. Ah, oh, I'm so glad that I get the chance to talk about this because it's something that excites me so much simply because I am... In, in no shape or form trying to simplify the scale of what it looks like. But I think there's something, there's something beautiful about having an idea of how you can move yourself out of something and into something that adds to your well-being. So this is something that I call the three pillars of self. And the first part of this, I see it as self-awareness. If we're just going to call it awareness, we can also do that. Where you just simply ask yourself a question, where am I holding back? From expressing myself in a way that I know is going to be beneficial, right? Where am I holding back from expressing a differing point of view? And it doesn't have to be anything um, inflammatory or anything you even have to share publicly. The entire thing is a very internal experience, which I think can also just release a little bit of pressure because we, I think especially now because of social media, we think we have to externalize everything, but I, I don't think it's that's not even close to the truth. It's a very internal process. So just ask yourself, where am I holding back from expressing what I really need to express? Really bring awareness to whatever that discomfort is that is keeping you in censorship. Then the second pillar, I see it as self-responsibility, where you have to get very clear on what your values are. So you can say to yourself, I know that I feel uncomfortable in expressing this differing opinion, but let me just tune into what my values are for a moment. Are your values freedom? Are your values trust? Are your values honesty? Is expression one of your values? So depending on whatever those values are, you make a commitment to take responsibility for what you're going to express. Trust that it's going to be coming from a mindful place. It's something that I call mindful speech, which I can also get into in a little while. Um, but really take responsibility for what it is you feel. Make that empowering commitment to yourself, even if you are afraid, even if you feel uncomfortable, and filter it through that awareness that we spoke about in the beginning so you can decide, okay, is this really unsafe or am I telling myself that it's unsafe? Because I think we, we immediately label everything as unsafe without actually filtering it through our self-awareness, being objective where it's necessary, but take responsibility for whatever you feel internally. Then the last process of self, I call that just expression. It's very simple, but it really is powerful. Self-expression, because to even get to that point, you need the awareness piece. You need the responsibility piece so that you can feel able to express yourself from a mindful place. So that's a very simplified way to put forward those three pillars. What I love, love, love about the way you've organized this mm -hmm. is that we have the self-awareness piece. And of course, from a psychological perspective, we cannot change what we are unaware of or what we're uh -huh. denying or what we're repressing. 
But the part that really hit me when you were doing the talk that I saw is the taking responsibility piece, because I can't tell you how many people will say to me, how can I draw boundaries or talk true, as I call it, and not have any conflict? Yes. Um, I, I do, when you figure that out, let me know, because I literally <laughs> don't know, but we can shift our mindset to conflict. And what you're saying here is to get out of self-censorship, to get into authentic self-expression, we go through these pillars that you've laid out for us. And don't worry, we'll put these in the show notes for those of yes. you who are watching or who are listening. This is an inside job. Mm -hmm. And you, you know, I always say to my, my therapy clients, like at the end of the day, when it's just you and you, you're looking in the mirror, like you know the truth. Yes. Right? You, we know the truth. And I think that stepping back from, you know, you're inviting us mm -hmm. to speak truthfully and, and the, the whole right language stuff, which I would love to get into, I would love to have you share a little bit about that, is a really important part of this. Because as I walk people through in the book, when we are establishing boundaries, when we are talking true, we are sharing a preference or disagreeing with someone, you know, we're using language that is about us. We got to make sure that we're on mm. our side of the street with what we're sharing. Yes. And you make a lot of these distinctions in your, if you guys are not following Africa, you want to be, because I'm always inspired by your Insta stuff. I, I want to get to one of these posts. I actually have it in my notes to talk about oh, amazing. <laughs> on this interview, but can, can you say a little bit more about right language or, or I'm not sure if that's what you called it, but what, what is your terminology? Mm. Can I ask you to elaborate just a little bit more, just in terms, because I find that really fascinating, actually, but I've, I, I haven't heard it laid out in that kind of way in terms of right language, how you define it. Meaning that if I'm sharing something, I disagree with something that you say, it is my right, if we're having a conversation, to share mm. my opinion, not to disparage your opinion simply to yes. stay on my side of the street and clearly and concisely say, well, I disagree. And this, this is my reason, or this is my thought, or this has been my experience. Rather than, I think that at least with boundaries, it's gotten a bad rap where people feel like you're being very caustic and you're being, you're rejecting mm. people and making people wrong. And it's being like, you're an idiot, which is not, that is not, talking true or sharing right. from a place that makes sense that's just inflammatory you know yes. so that's what I mean oh yes 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 oh that makes that makes sense completely and you know what this is where what I call mindful speech would fall in because here the th here's the thing I think um when I talk about self-censorship I think anyone that would want to sort of detract from what my message is which which doesn't happen at all which I think is is such, such, such a beautiful thing, especially on the internet. Um, I think it could be very easy to misconstrue my message and to think that I'm just saying everyone has free reign to say whatever you want and there are no consequences. But no, that's not true. We all have things that we think and things that we would want to say that are actually better kept to ourselves. To me, that's not necessarily self-censoring. I, I think that's mindful speech. I think that is still following that process of filtering something through your self-awareness, saying, okay, I take responsibility for what I feel, but is it necessary for me to take it to that third pillar of self-expression? And even if you decide that actually it is necessary for me to take it to that third pillar, maybe it's an opportunity for you to express that internally and it actually doesn't need to be externalized, right? So I think we all have um, a right to expressing ourselves, but we also have the right and a responsibility to do it in a mindful way. Does, does that does that kind of make sense? Absolutely. But I, I want to go back and say something about you said yeah. you don't you don't get a lot of you know of this pushback on mm -hmm. social, but I can say from my observation, from a therapeutic yeah. point of view, part of why you don't is that you create proactive boundaries mm. with your posts you are proactive yeah so people are very clear as to what 
where your boundaries are and what mm. kind of crap you will or will not tolerate in your comment section, right? Yes, yes. <laughs> it's, tr- it's true. You're absolutely right. Thank you for that reflection because of course it's it's something that I do, but I think it's because, and I know um, this, the, we'll, we'll explore this as we go further, but I think when you've had experiences with being so boundaryless and not even knowing that they're a thing, I think once you really discover that, oh my goodness, I, I get to have boundaries, I get to set the terms of engagement, oh, that's such a liberating thing. So now it's at the point where it's a default for me to do that because I want to respect both of us. You, you're going to respect me. Well, I can, I, I hope that you do, but I need to make it easier for you to do so Mm -hmm. and the other way around so yeah I love that I love that and and also the whole thing with consequences there are you know internal and external consequences for all of these things so if we continue in life where we are self-censoring the consequences are great and they're cumulative Mm. So it's one thing when you're 22 and it's another thing when you're 52. And if you've had decades of like stuffing down how you really feel, you know, psychologically, it doesn't work that we can just say, well, this is inconvenient. So I'm just going to ignore it. Mm. And you can do it for a while, but it doesn't last because those emotions don't just disappear because we don't like them. Right. Right. And you know what, I I wonder what you think about this, Terry, but something that I often think and say out loud is that once you do become very highly skilled at censoring yourself, let's say from the age of 10 up until the age of 40 or 50, even your 30s, um, I believe that it then becomes very difficult, even uncomfortable to witness other people that are in the fullest expression, (laughs) right? Is this something that you that you see as well? It's so true. Here's the thing. When we sort of are operating on this, we think it's like a social agreement, so to speak. Don't be rude. Say yes when you want to say no, because that's the be a good girl. That's the kind Mm -hmm. thing to do. When we see others in their full expression, drawing boundaries, not self-censoring, right? Having mindful speech, Mm-hmm. We want to judge. We want to be like, yes. what, what, the, what the hell is Betty thinking? Like who gave yeah. Betty permission to like be a full human being? Right. Right. And the internet makes it so easy in the comfort of your own home to really allow that to fully, um, interestingly enough, express itself, but it's not the kind of expression that you have <laughs> chosen. It's almost like it's the default as a result of, that level of suppression. Yes, it's like though an explosion. What Mm. ends up happening is we can contain, 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 and then there will come a point and it'll be some unsuspecting schmo on the internet who didn't do anything to you, who's like, (laughs) why is this person going off on me? Or it's like, we don't even know why, you know, as Malcolm Gladwell, you know, the tipping point, like we don't even know what, what, why am I the tipping point? And again, we don't have to know, but I, I, you know, back in the day when I was maybe slightly more caustic, I used to say that, you know, the trolls on the internet, people who are really out there because they, they're discharging their toxic negativity or their frustration about what they're not doing in their life. It's like they have cyber balls, I call them, mm. because it's not actual courage <laughs> because you know, they would never say that shit to your face ever. Yes. Yes. Right. The, the anonymity um, is something that creates um, people, you know, I, I don't know. I feel like there's a lot of shadow mm-hmm. of our collective that mm-hmm. we've been seeing. And the internet certainly is a breeding ground, of course, yes. for that. Right. Yes. Right. And you know what? That's exactly what I um, refer to in my work as collective sabotage which is why I was saying that for for such a long time, um, four years very specifically, I was researching, trying to find out what what is this concept of self-sabotage. And once you unpick it enough, you realize that for a lot of people, they're not sabotaging themselves on purpose because they hate themselves. You know, it's a a form of self-protection. So once I really started to understand that, I would say for me, the year of 2020, very, 
specifically allowed me to realize that, oh my goodness, what we're witnessing is actually collective sabotage. And if you go online, we've normalized that collective sabotage where people kind of expect someone to be mobbed in the comment section. It's, it's sort of expected, right? So it's creating this sort of normalcy that is quite sinister. Um, but I really do think the year of 2020 had just so many ingredients <laughs> to create the environment that we're seeing right now. But I'm, I, I do remain hopeful. I really, really do. I do. I mean, I feel like we collectively, I hope, my hope is that we have hit a tipping point of other sorts mm. of having these more open dialogues. But what you're really saying, and I think part of why your work just, just resonated so deeply with me is that we all have the right to think what we think. And if we spend our lives suppressing what we think, denying what we think, censoring what we think, um, mm. feeling like we must say what we think or we must not say what we think as you you talk about both aspects of that. Yeah. It's like we we will never get to the solutions that we need as a whole, as yes. the, the world. And you're really talking about how do we have respectful dialogue that allows you to be different than me, me to be different than you, we can have different things. One of your, your recent posts was like, I know it's amazing, but you could agree with one thing <laughs> someone says and not, not like everything that ever came out of their mouth and that we, we get to choose. And I think that there is such a, there has been such a mob mentality and mm -hmm. this whole cancel culture and the, this fear yeah. of making mistakes and yet I've just decided because 2020 and 2019 going 2020 was a big year for me as well. All of us mm. pandemic and everything that was happening in the US, all the racial yes. the murder of George Floyd. I mean, there was so much happening. And the elections. Oh my God, just, I was just exhausted. Just, and I was writing a book and my mother had cancer. I mean, there was oh. all of these things happening at one time. She's fine now, thank God. Good. But again, the, the bandwidth and what I feel like is, has happened, at least for me personally, is I've just become more willing to make mistakes. Mm. And if I need to course correct, if I need to make amends, if I should apologize for some, for harming someone, whether it was intentional or not, then just being um, secure enough within myself to do those things and not self-censor like mm. crazy, because part of my job and my my gift and my dharma yes. is to help others and I can't do that if I'm so friggin' paranoid that like someone's gonna friggin' cancel me because they don't like a guest I had on my show or because they don't believe in trans people like do you know what I mean right like, right that, like you just I don't know I feel like we face such so much during yeah. that time that for me it made me a little bit less tender and a little bit more courageous Mm. to just go I could just be a human I am a human yes yes oh I love that I actually got chills as you were speaking um I love that so so much and you know something that I have noticed actually coming out of 2020 into 2021 is that there are people I would say like you and I in this specific context that have really come out of it thinking actually no I I'm I'm going to give myself that permission slip that I seem to have been looking for in in other places then there are people who I actually think this might be the majority of people including very very young people that are terrified to even consider thinking for themselves or being themselves, which is why I believe that people like you and I and many other wonderful people, the fact that we can even have this conversation, that's what makes me hopeful. Because it means that even if five people, 10 people hear this conversation, and then they realize that, oh my goodness, I get to give myself that permission slip. I went through a very similar thing. It creates such a beautiful ripple effect because there's, there's a ripple effect that's already happening. Which, which can be slowed down by us being really intentional um, about what we choose to do now. But I, yeah, I, I love that so much. Is it okay? I wanna read um, this yes. post of yours yes. that I really love because it's also not a popular um, stance. 
So I'm going to read it. Ready to go. Shaming strangers and even people you know or think you know, in quotes, to speak about social issues they know nothing about is not as progressive as you might think, especially when you know very little yourself. It's presumptuous, strange, and unethical on many levels. And then it went on, you went on to say, a gentle yet firm reminder on the many shades of entitlement. You requested mm -hmm. that I make this permanent post. Okay. So really, sometimes the most sensible thing to say is, I don't have anything to say about this. Mm -hmm. Saying anything isn't always better than saying nothing. Surely the past year has shown us this. The Silence is Violence Brigade don't get to decide how you choose to use your voice, your platform, and all the in-between. You're not a bad person for having the capacity to care for every single, for not having the capacity to care mm. for every single cause and social issue. It's not even humanly possible, emphasis on human. Don't mm. allow yourself to be guilted into believing that being mindful of what you speak out on or choosing to not say a damn thing for reasons personal to you equals apathy. Everyone's mm -hmm. capacity is capped. We cannot care about every single thing. Convincing yourself otherwise is a surefire way to make yourself sick, which I totally agree with. Mm -hmm. And once you convince yourself that this is the norm, you will then start to project onto others as we see on social media, although this is seeping into our everyday lives. Mm -hmm. So this is a message I'll continue to repeat and often because the entitlement running through many of us is astounding. And mm -hmm. I know that it often comes comes from a good place, but it quickly becomes insufferable. Okay. It, <laughs> it goes on, but it's amazing. So tell me what inspired this. And I want to talk a little bit about this, this thought, this notion, because this really, really, really hit me yes. in a very um, hopeful place, actually. Yes. Oh, thank you for reading that back to me because, you know, sometimes, um, because I, I share a lot of things and write a lot of things and I do sit on my writings and explore them and expand on them. Um, but it's not often you get to hear someone reading mm -hmm. back something you've written. It, it's, it doesn't really happen on a day-to-day -day basis. <laughs> it's true. And the, uh, that's a message that I could also do with, even though I wrote it. It's really nice to just hear that reflected back. So thank you. Um, but you know, this is another case of, once you say these things out loud, it sounds so obvious. Of course, we don't have the capacity to care for every single thing that is currently happening in the world. I always think about it in this way that suffering has existed before you, it's going to exist after you, right? There are many things that we're not able to hold at the same time. And this came specifically from, um, I cannot remember what the specific conflict was. Actually, I do. I believe that it was the Palestine-Israel conflict a few months mm. ago. Um, and I saw a few people demanding that everyone speak up. Why are you not speaking up? Not directly to me, but I could, I could see people just resharing certain things. Um, you know, you have a platform of 10,000 people, 20,000 people. Why are you not saying anything? Just yeah. that kind of messaging, which again has been normalized it's just sort of seen as something that happens on social media and that's just how it is um but it, it really didn't sit well with me because when you think about it we all pick and choose and this is just normal we all care about things in different ways there are some people that care about animal rights more than i do i care about fgm happening in africa more than other people do etc 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 right it would be very entitled of me. And this is a visual that I have. <laughs> Let's say, for example, now I was to leave my house and walk down my street, knocking on every single door, shouting and asking them why they are not talking about FGM in Ethiopia, right? Mm -hmm. That's the visual that I have on the internet, knocking on people's doors, demanding that they evoke the same level of care that you do, wanting people to speak on command when you decide that now is the right time, right? Wanting people to regurgitate an infographic that you found yesterday. <laughs> I just don't think that's acceptable. <laughs> it, it is so true. And for those listening who don't know what FGM is, it's female genital mutilation. Yes. A practice that is still done in many countries in yeah. the world. Yes, indeed. Um, but I just want to say that because I guarantee you people were going to be like, wait, what is that? Right. What is um, that? <laughs> so, so this, 
this whole stance and this whole mindset of the the not self censoring. Mm. This applies to what we're talking about right now too. Yes, because feeling compelled to speak on something that either you don't feel that way about. It, it's like, listen, there's one thing to want to inspire people. Um, in this country, we have such broken and fractured and painful race relations that we've had for mm. so long. And I think that there's been major shifts and major changes. And I think that's great. So inspiring people to do their work, to learn the history of the country that you live in. I feel like all of those things are, we can't demand people to do it. But, but mm. it, it can be an invitation to do it, which is different than what, than what we're talking about, where exactly, I think that the um, Israel-Palestine thing is a perfect example of people saying, mm. if you don't post about this, you are, this is how you feel. This is what you right. think. This is what you're saying. You, you, you are for people being harmed. You are, mm. you are part, you know, and you're like, so anyway, I, I love the, the reality check that yes. is your stance on this. And it's not to say, don't be passionate about things. It's exactly. to say, respect other people's right to choose what they are passionate about based on their life experience, their past hurts, their desire for the future, right? Yes, 100%. And even if, you know, we zoom out even more, because that's, I like to use the concept of zooming out because I think we're so zoomed in constantly to our own subjective experience that we forget there's an entire world out there. Enti billions of realities, even when you consider that one individual can hold so many realities, now make that billions of people. So, it, right. so when people demand, for example, that someone speak about a conflict that is happening in the mi Middle East and they, you know, put this message out into the void that is social media. What if I'm in Kenya and I have no idea what's happening in another country because there's so much conflict that is already happening in my country. <laughs> there's so much on a day-to-day -day that I have to think about. So I use social media very specifically just to catch up with my friends, just to kind of see what's happening, just to escape a little bit, which is what a lot of people use social media for. It's right. not to become, you know, to be tuned into what's happening on the other side of the world. That It just isn't, you know. So I think when you lay things out in that kind of way, I, I would hope that it allows someone to be like, oh, my goodness. Oh, yeah, I'm I'm in I'm in Boston. Why did I expect someone in <laughs> to to start speaking about what's happening in my it, with the elections in the U.S.? Right. right. So the, the entitlement and. I, I think this also ties in with boundaries. It seems like a very boundaryless process. Like you don't have any boundaries yourself, maybe. So you you couldn't possibly even start to think about respecting someone else's boundaries or taking into account what they're, yeah, it's just a, yeah. It's a way of looking at it though, Africa, that I think is very helpful. And, mm. you know, you, you talk a little bit about it as, um, you know, the entitlement, like this feeling that, that I'm entitled to dictate what you do. And the reality is I'm not, that's it. Like I, I'm actually not, <laughs> I don't, I'm not entitled to tell you what to do. So I, I, the, the reframe on this and, and this, this whole conversation that you are bringing forth. And what mm. I really, really appreciate you about you as well is you are really precise and articulate, which mm -hmm. is my favorite, favorite thing for anyone who puts anything out there, because I want, I want the, the granular, I want to really understand what you're saying. Yes. And you are um, cautious with your words without being paranoid, meaning your mm -hmm. precision. So I just appreciate that about you so much, because I don't, when I read your stuff, I never am like, what is she saying? Like, what is she actually <laughs> saying? Because you say, <laughs> what you're actually saying. Yes. Thank right? you. It's thank not you, hidden. Terry. You're welcome. All right. I want to ask you um, a question. I ask everyone who comes on the show or most people personally, what has been your most challenging boundary struggle and how did you overcome it? Mm. Oh, such a good question. Um, my biggest boundary struggle was most definitely related to alcohol because I didn't, I didn't have any boundaries with it, or 
I didn't have any boundaries with myself. So of course I didn't have any boundaries with it. Um, but it was accepting that drinking is not an option for me. I, I would say, I would say that was my biggest area of really trying to figure out what are my boundaries with this? You know, I toyed with moderation for a little while. I thought, okay, one glass of wine and then I'll have one glass of water. So it was a, a strategy, but that's no fun. Who wants to, who wants to, <laughs> no one wants to do that, right? No. Um, but I tried, so I was introducing myself to the concept of boundaries in a very slow and kind of small way, but it was painful because I, it, it meant I had to change my reality. I had to take a close look at my identity and create a new one. So I would say alcohol was the biggest area that allowed me to even understand what boundaries were up until the point of getting sober completely, which is when I really started to step into that concept. That is so beautiful. And congratulations on Thank your you. sobriety, because really everything does. I mean, I've been sober for many, many years and alcohol uh, was also my drug of choice. Really? And yes. Yes. And anything, you know, you know what they say in the rooms, you know, anything you put above your sobriety, you lose. Yes. And I think that there is something very, very true about that. And so I love that that was your greatest boundary accomplishment because mm. it opened up everything else that is now happening in your life. Yes. Yes. So it was the biggest struggle and the biggest accomplishment. I love that. I love it. So tell us where we can find you. Where can people see you? What do you have coming up? I want to know all yes. the things. Yes. So the only social media platform that I have right now is Instagram, which is where I do a lot of live videos. I do a lot of live podcasting, um, which is just my favorite thing. Terry, I could speak for hours. If I have my tea, oh, I can, I can go. <laughs> Here we've we got are. our tea. Yes, we do. <laughs> Oh, so we need. You can, right. So you can find me on Instagram, Africa Brook with an E at the end. Um, if you want to know more about how I work and who I work with and the specific methodologies that I use, etc., all that fun, serious stuff, you can go to my website, africabrook.com. Um, I am working on a live show. So it's going to be the first live show that I do broaching these subjects, but I think there's something about doing things in person. And I, I really want to bring that back in the best way that I can. Um, so through my website and my social media, you can find out more information on what that will look like. I'm planning to start with a London show and then bring it to the US somewhere. So it's all very exciting. Yes. We'll come to New so York, York obviously. To you. Yes. yes. <laughs> um, so those are my places, Instagram or my website. Excellent. Well, I want to say thank you. Thank you. Thank you for spending so much time with us today. Mm -hmm. I truly and deeply appreciate you. Thank you so much, Terry. Thank you.